This, uh, these next two talks are adult congenital heart disease, which as with pregnancy, very few of us know very much about. So I would listen very carefully to the next two talks, absorb as much as you can and use it. So as Dr. Warns walks up to the podium, let's go over the question number one. A 25 year old with Down syndrome residing in a care home comes to the clinic because he's getting more short of breath when he climbs stairs. He was quite active, participating in the Special Olympics, but now is more tired. The caregivers aware that a murmur was heard during childhood, but the parents didn't want any intervention. So on examination, the oxygen saturation is normal, the venous pressure is normal, the blood pressure is normal, there's an RV lift, the apical impulse is displaced laterally. He has a two over six systolic ejection murmur in the pulmonary area with a wide split second heart sound. And at the apex, there's a three over six holosystolic murmur. Now you might wonder why such attention is being paid for, is being put on the physical examination, especially in congenital disease, and we did in valve disease. But actually the boards are going to have a lot of questions in which they're gonna give you the examination and it's a second or third order question in which you'll be expected to make the diagnosis based on the examination and then apply your knowledge to management. So this is the examination here. This is the electrocardiogram here. For the next one, move one more. We'll go back one for the electrocardiogram so you can see. I'll give you few seconds to look at that. And there's some abnormalities here. So then the question is this, which of the following is most likely diagnosis? Secundum ASD, muscular VSD, pulmonary stenosis, Epstein's anomaly, or premium ASD? Okay, a little scattered there. Question number two, which one of the following is true regarding coarctation? Usually occurs just proximal to the left subclavian after end to end repair. Most patient, patients have a normal blood pressure at follow up. Ascending aortic aneurysms do not occur if coarctation is repaired in the first year of life. A Dacron patch repair is more commonly associated with an aneurysm formation and repair before the age of 14 is associated with a normal survival. So which of the following is true regarding a patient with a coarctation of the aorta? Okay, a little scatter there. Question three, a 24-year-old man with a history of heart murmurs since childhood presents for evaluation. On examination, the venous pressure is normal, period. The blood pressure is 118, has a parasternal thrill with a loud holosystolic murmur in clear lung fields. His echo shows normal LV size with a normal ejection fraction, and there's an echo dropout in the ventricular septum adjacent to the tricuspid valve through which the Doppler jet has a velocity of five meter per second. So the, the jet of this thing right next to the tricuspid valve is five meter per second. This TR jet is 2.3 meter per second. So which of the following is true? He needs a cardiac catheterization to assess hemodynamics and degree of shunt. He should have a repair of his tricuspid valve he should have reassurance, no intervention, and repeat exam in five years. He should have surgical closure of his VSD. He should be referred to a pulmonary hypertension clinic for consideration of pulmonary vasodilator therapy. A little slower with the answer here. Okay. So some scatter. 35-year-old woman with one year of palpitations presents with atrial fibrillation. She's got an RV lift, two over six systolic ejection murmur at the left sternal border, 
and a diastolic rumble at the lower left sternal border. We'll show you the chest x-ray in just a minute. The echo shows a normal LV, a moderately enlarged RV. Both atrial and ventricular septum appear intact. The estimated RV systolic pressure is 40. The pulmonary valve is not well seen. Here's the chest x-ray. What's the most likely diagnosis? Sinus phenosis AST, pulmonary stenosis, VSD, tricuspid stenosis, or Epstein's anomaly. I'll bet there's going to be a scatter here. There's um, quite a scatter. And this is something that I hope will be a learning opportunity for everybody. 40-year-old woman history of heart murmur comes for evaluation of progressive dyspnea. She's got an A-wave intravenous pressure, an RV lift, an ejection click with a 3 over 6 systolic ejection murmur at the left sternal border, which increases with inspiration. She's got a normal LV, a normal RV, with some hypertrophy and mild TR, but the TR velocity is 4.5 meter per second. And it's hard to image the rest of her heart. What is the most appropriate procedure? TEE, CT scan, cardiac cath to look for left to right shunt, cardiac cath planning a balloon valvotomy, cardiac cath with nitric oxide to assess pulmonary reactivity, as Dr. Kushwaha talked to you about the first day. So the TR velocity is 4.5 meter per second. All right. Got a scatter. So at the podium, we have Dr. Carol Warns, um, who is um, like the leading expert in the world in adult congenital heart disease, came over from England to establish this in America, established our clinic that um, Heidi works in and a, um, a number of our others who are fully trained. We're going to have her give you two lectures. The first one is on the simple lesions after you're overwhelmed, we'll give you a break, and then you'll come back and have another one on complex lesions. So, um, Dr. Warns, go ahead with simple lesions. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be back here again and talk about um, my favorite subject. My learning objectives are, as you see, we're going to look at the anatomy pathophysiology, a lot of clinical presentation, imaging, and treatment of a group of congenital lesions, which I've defined as simple, left to right shunt, some congenital valve abnormalities, including pulmonary stenosis and Epstein's, coarctation, and I'm going to touch on some cardiovascular implications of genetic syndromes. So why should you know anything about adult congenital heart disease? Well, I'd remind you that 1% of babies are born with some sort of congenital anomaly and there's probably almost 2 million adults now in the USA with congenital heart disease. So you are going to see them uh, in your practice for sure. There are more adults than children. And the growth of the population is about 5% per year, largely because of um, surgery and its success over the last 60 years or so. There are guidelines for congenital heart disease. This was the second one that we've had published, and I draw your attention to these, which will give you some indications for um, how to intervene and how to assess these patients. So let's begin. I'm going to go through these simple lesions. Let's begin with one of the most common, a secundum ASD. And I'm going to show you some anatomy pictures, and the echo pictures I show you will be apex down so they will correspond with the anatomy pictures. And here you see a classic, a very large secundum atrial septal defect 
in the middle around the fossa ovalis, and the consequences of that with the left to right shunt is right atrial and right ventricular enlargement. And here you see an example with a very large secundum defect. What do we find on exam? The JVP is either normal or just slightly elevated. And because of that RV volume overload, you may feel a right ventricular lift. Flow through the ASD is inaudible, but what you do hear is flow through the pulmonary artery. So it's an ejection systolic murmur which relates to increased flow, never louder than grade three over six. The second sound, as you remember from medical school, is fixed split. And because of the increased flow across the tricuspid valve, you may get a tricuspid diastolic flow rumble. Usually that means the shunt is more than two and a half to one. So the murmur is that increased flow through the pulmonary artery in the second interspace. I'd remind you there is a genetic defect that can sometimes be associated with an ASD. This is Holt Aurum, sometimes called heart hand syndrome, with abnormalities of the thumb or the digits, and that can be associated with an ASD. I'm going to talk about the classic ECG and the classic chest X-ray. And of course, the diagnosis most commonly is made by echocardiography. I'd remind you that the guidelines emphasize, and I'm going to say this for every single shunt, that when you're thinking about closing shunts, you have to be absolutely certain you're not dealing with any pulmonary hypertension of any importance and pulmonary vascular disease. So you want pulse oximetry both at rest and on exercise to be sure there's no right to left shunting. That's very important. Here's a classic uh, ECG that you see here. There is often right axis deviation and either partial or complete right bundle branch block. I draw your attention to this too, as you see in the red circles. This is called crochetage, this notching on the R waves in the inferior limb leads. And again, here you see incomplete right bundle branch block in V1. This is quite sensitive and quite specific for an atrial septal defect. Now, here's the chest X-ray, which many of you stumbled on. This is a large secundum atrial septal defect, and I draw your attention to several features. First of all, the heart is enlarged. The right atrium is enlarged. The right ventricle is enlarged. How do I know this is an RV? Because it comes down steeply and vertically to the diaphragm with a sort of shoulder here. Notice there is pulmonary plethora in the center of the lung fields. This is flow from left to right. And very importantly, coming down the left side, the first mogul is the aorta, but look at the size of mogul number two. This is a huge pulmonary artery and the shadow is confined to the heart border. It's big because there is increased flow from left to right. This is a classic secundum atrial septal defect. Notice that pulmonary artery, that's a clue. Here's another one that's not so pronounced, but still in a young person, mogul number two, the pulmonary artery should not be bigger than the aorta. Again, we have right ventricular enlargement, right atrial prominence, and pulmonary plethora. This also is a significant left to right shunt, but a little bit smaller. So when do we close them? We close them when there is right atrial and right ventricular enlargement, with or without symptoms, and you see the guidelines here. You don't need to catheterize somebody to find out what the shunt is. If the ASD is of any size, the right atrium, right ventricular is enlarged, then you've got a shunt of more than 1.5 to 1. You do not need to catheterize unless there's uncertainty about pulmonary vascular disease. So again, there's my warning sign. Be absolutely sure you're not dealing with Eisenmenger syndrome or someone on the way to Eisenmenger syndrome. The PA systolic pressure should be less than 50% systemic, the PVR less than a third systemic vascular resistance, 
and again, pulse oximeter on both rest and exercise. If you have right to left shunting, that's a warning. ASD, of course, with atrial fibrillation and pregnancy doesn't occur in any CHADS VAS score, but you have to be very careful because these patients, particularly in pregnancy with a DVT, may present with stroke. So atrial fibrillation with an ASD is an indication to anticoagulate. So there's a warning sign. Notice in these x-rays that I've showed you that you do not get left atrial enlargement. You just get right atrial enlargement. Unless the patient is older, over 40, maybe you're dealing with diastolic dysfunction or something, or they have atrial fibrillation. If it's a young patient with an ASD and the left atrium is enlarged, think of something else like a primum ASD, and we'll discuss that in just a moment. What's the natural history? Patients develop atrial fibrillation in their 50s, and we have to remember that closing the ASD in adulthood does not prevent atrial fibrillation. But what we know is the earlier the ASD is closed, the less likely patients are to have atrial fibrillation and the consequence of stroke. We learned this from a very early study from Mayo Clinic. Um, 123 patients with surgical repair in the early years, most were symptomatic, and they were followed for over 30 years. And what we learned was that patients who had closure under 25 years of age had a long-term survival similar to age-matched controls. But let's look at the data by quartiles of age. On the top here, you see patients repaired under 11 and then from 12 to 24 years, and they have a normal survival compared to the controls. But now let's look at older patients, 25 to 41, and patients over 40. Notice that there is a dramatic difference in their survival with a lesion you might consider, quotes, corrected, they do not have a normal survival when they're older because they get atrial fibrillation and consequences of stroke. Hence the impetus to close these defects earlier in life. And we can close them surgically, either with a suture or a patch. We can do it through a sternotomy or cosmetically a nice inframammary incision, which is invisible. Or nowadays, we can close them with devices, which of course is increasingly popular, and I show just two of them here. What about device closure uh, and controls? Do they do very well? Here's some recent data looking at mortality of um, device closure compared to controls. And again, here you can see it's not normal for this simple lesion. Cumulative cardiovascular mortality is still not normal compared to controls for this apparently simple lesion that you might think is fixed. Similarly here, when we look at age and all-cause survival, even with device closure, which is relatively straightforward, as you look at all ages, survival is worse as you follow them along the older you are when the ASD is closed. Similarly, with CV mortality. The older you are, the worse the survival. So if you find an ASD in a young patient, regardless of symptoms, the right side is big. You close it as long as there's no problem with pulmonovascular disease. Better outcomes if you close early. So let's move on to more complicated lesions. The sinus venosus defect, which is easy to miss. This is the defect that occurs in the superior portion of the septum and its posterior, as you see in this picture, to the fossa ovalis. And this one is a double whammy for the right ventricle and right atrium because it's usually associated with an anomalous right upper pulmonary vein. So two volume lesions on the right side. Here's a typical echocardiogram in short axis. If you see this right ventricular enlargement, you have a shunt somewhere. There is some volume lesion, so you have to find it one way or another. 
a sinus venosus defect we can often see from the subcostal window, which may be overlooked. Here you see a sizable defect here with a big right atrium and a big right ventricle, and the defect is highlighted there. You can even see the anomalous right pulmonary vein. And if there's any doubt, if you see right ventricular volume overload on any person, you need other imaging if you can't find the shunt, either a TEE or an MR or CT scanning. If you have RV volume overload and you can't see a secundum ASD and you can't find a sinus venosus ASD or any other ASD, think anomalous pulmonary veins because you may have isolated anomalous pulmonary veins without an ASD. So you are obliged to find the shunt by some form of imaging. Anomalous pulmonary veins most commonly drain into the right side, either into the SVC-RA junction, the RA itself, or with the scimitar syndrome into the inferior vena cava. So you have to look for them by imaging. And if they drain from the left side, which is less common, sometimes you can see them uh, even on a transthoracic echo. Here you see left pulmonary veins draining into a vertical vein, which drains to the anominate vein and over to the right side, hence right-sided volume overload. So you can diagnose it on a transthoracic study. If you can't find it, again, other imaging is important. Here you see red flow coming north and coming around to the right side. Another kind of more complicated defect. Now, this is where the terminology can get a bit confusing. I'm going to talk about atrioventricular septal defects. What does that mean? A primum atrial septal defect is exactly the same as a partial AV canal. This is a defect now that's in the lower part of the septum. And in this circumstance, the AV valves are always abnormal and they are always on the same level. The mitral valve is usually cleft and I'll show you. And AV defects, as we call them, are the most common defects associated with Down's syndrome. Now, let's go back to some basic anatomy, the crux of the heart. Here you see it anatomically, and I would remind you that the tricuspid valve is always, always the lowermost, i.e. most inferior, apically displaced valve, quite different from the mitral valve. The tricuspid valve always enters a right ventricle. And between the mitral and the tricuspid valve is a bit of tissue. This is the atrioventricular septum. You could poke a pin from the left ventricle into the right atrium. So this is the AV septum, and it is that septum that is deficient in all AV defects. Here you see the anatomic specimen on the right. So when you have a primum atrial septal defect, also known as a partial AV canal, you will have left to right shunting, so right-sided enlargement. Here you see a defect and notice that the AV valves are on the same level. That is how you make the diagnosis. Here's a real-time echo. This is not a very big defect, but you can certainly see flow coming through this little defect here. And notice that there is really severe mitral regurgitation. Again, the mitral valve's abnormal and is associated with a cleft and often severe mitral regurgitation. Here's the anatomic specimen, a very big defect, right ventricular volume overload and a big right atrium, and the AV valves are on the same level, and the mitral valve looks quite thick and gnarly, as you see here. This is what it looks like from the left ventricle. This anterior mitral valve leaflet sort of has a bit missing. It's as if somebody took a piece of the pie because the anterior leaflet should be a semicircle. Here you see the big ASD above, but this mitral valve will leak like a drain because it has this large cleft. So the patients require patch closure of the defect as well as repair of the mitral valve cleft. 
Short axis, you see the cleft here, instead of that classic fish mouth of the mitral valve, here you have a gap through which there is mitral regurgitation. So these defects need to have surgical closure. They cannot be repaired by any percutaneous technique. In this situation, the ECG is different from a secundum ASD, and that should give you the warning. Here you have left axis deviation and either partial or complete right bundle branch block. It's unusual to have left axis deviation with a secundum defect. Uh, in this situation, it's really very common, and you may have a prolonged PR interval first degree AV block. Think of primum atrial septal defect with this ECG. I'd remind you that because of this change in the AV valve anatomy, as you look at the heart in blue, you see the distance from the apex of the heart to the aortic valve. That is increased in this situation. But from the crux of the heart where the AV valves are to the apex, that's foreshortened. So when you look at an angiogram, this is described in the textbooks as the classic gooseneck deformity, as you see here and just to remind you what one of the local geese looks like. So this is typical because of this abnormal AV valve anatomy. Primum ASD is exactly the same as partial AV canal. So to summarize, sinus venosus defects, primum ASDs cannot be closed with the device. If you have any symptoms, right-sided enlargement, surgical repair, class one indication. Again, beware. Be sure there's no pulmonary hypertension, no right to left shunting, systolic pulmonary pressure, less than 50% systemic, pulmonary vascular resistance, less than a third systemic. If there's doubt, you need to catheterize the patient, and that's a sophisticated hemodynamic study. So let's move on now to complete AV canal. What does that mean? Now you're dealing with an atrial septal defect above the crux of the heart, but now there is also a ventricular component to the defect. And here's the anatomy. You see there's one big AV valve attached to the crest of the septum by these cords. And in here is a ventricular component to the defect. It looks almost like there's a swallow floating above the ventricular septum. So think of this, now you have a left to right shunt through an atrial defect, and you have a left to right shunt through a ventricular defect. So of course you'll get right-sided enlargement, and if these patients are not repaired early in life, they typically will develop Eisenmenger syndrome, pulmonary vascular disease. Here's the echo in real time. Again, you have AV valve regurgitation, but an atrial defect and a ventricular defect with concerns for a big left to right shunt and the development of pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary vascular disease. Okay, moving on then to the simple VSD. Not really much to say about it. Small defects, as you know, make a loud noise and are often accompanied by a thrill. Many patients may be asymptomatic and require no therapy. Larger defects, however, because you have increased flow, from the left to the right and blood goes around the circuit and comes back to the mitral valve, you may have a mitral diastolic flow rumble. VSDs cause left ventricular enlargement. VSDs cause left ventricular enlargement if they're of any size. If the LV is big, you close the defect. If the LV is normal size and there's a loud murmur, you leave them alone. You don't need to do anything with them. If you have a large defect, of course, you may develop Eisenmenger syndrome. And in that circumstance, there may be little or no murmur because there's almost no flow across the defect because the pressure in the right side is pretty much the same as the left side. So it doesn't make much noise in terms of a murmur. VSDs may close spontaneously quite often. They're often benign. Just beware those defects that occur immediately beneath 
the pulmonary valve, they're called outlet or supracrystal VSDs because they can be associated with the progression of aortic regurgitation. Your patient deserves one visit to an adult congenital heart disease clinic for assessment. Patent ductus arteriosus, you're familiar with this, this communication between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, as you see here in the schematic and in the anatomy specimen. These are said to be associated with maternal rubella and are more common in women. And because you've got essentially an arteriovenous fistula here, you'll have bounding pulses and a wide pulse pressure with a dynamic left ventricle. If it's small, you may have a thrill in the second interspace. And this is when you get this classic in the textbooks machinery murmur, which envelops the second sound. So it'll go whoosh, 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 continuously with no interruption. Anytime you hear that continuous murmur, this is your differential. Think of any kind of fistula. Rarely something called an aortopulmonary window, which is also a fistula. A ruptured sinus of Valsalva aneurysm, that can also produce a continuous murmur. And one differential can be a VSD with aortic regurgitation, but that murmur is not really continuous. It's usually whoosh, 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 whoosh. But if you're not awake, you can be confused. So that can be in the differential, and very rarely a tight coarctation will produce a continuous murmur instead of just a systolic murmur. So there's your differential with continuous murmurs. When do we close a ductus in adulthood? When the left side is enlarged and you still have a left to right shunt, again, with the caveat about no pulmonary hypertension. That's really important. So if the left side is big and you've got a left to right shunt, you can close the defect either with surgery or nowadays more commonly with a plug device to close it up. Now, let's turn our attention to congenital valve disease. And this is important and a common question on boards. Pulmonary stenosis. How do we make the diagnosis? First of all, good old bedside physical exam. You see an A wave in the jugular venous pressure. You do not see a V wave because usually there's no tricuspid regurgitation. The right ventricle will hypertrophy and produce a heave on parasternal exam. You may hear an ejection click with a mobile valve and a murmur, and P2 becomes late and quiet and may be inaudible if the valve is calcified. Now, important things to remember. The murmur of pulmonary stenosis is louder on inspiration. You take a breath in, you suck blood into the RV, more goes out to the pulmonary artery, so the murmur gets louder. The earlier the click, the more severe the stenosis. Why? Because the RV pressure is higher, so it forces that valve open earlier. The click may decrease on inspiration. I'll say that again. The click may decrease or even disappear on inspiration. It is the one right-sided sound that gets quieter with inspiration. Why? Because again, when you take a breath in, more blood enters the right ventricle and it moves the valve north so that the systolic excursion is decreased so the click gets quieter. It's the one right-sided sound that gets quieter on inspiration. Pulmonary stenosis can be associated with Noonan syndrome. In that case, the valve may be dysplastic, like a lump of cartilage, and there may be no click. What is Noonan syndrome? It's similar to Turner's syndrome. Patients have short stature, a web neck, low hairline, wide spaced eyes, low set ears, and some famous actors and actresses, this is Linda Hunt, who's only four foot nine, have made no secret of their Noonan syndrome, and pulmonary stenosis is a classic concomitant that goes along with that. Some have impaired intelligence, many do not. I like to show this slide 
because this is an autosomal dominant lesion. You see again the wide spaced eyes, the low bridge of the nose, low ears, and so on. And this is a daddy Noonan who married a mummy with Noonan, and so because it's an autosomal dominant, they had a baby Noonan and all have pulmonary stenosis. I like to say opposites don't always attract. So what do we do about pulmonary stenosis? How do we define it? A mild gradient is less than 36, less than three meters a second on your Doppler. Moderate 36 to 64 millimeters. Severe is when the peak gradient is more than four meters a second or a mean greater than 35. You do not get right ventricular failure with pulmonary stenosis unless you're at least over 50, unless there's associated lesions or an arrhythmia. You do not get right ventricular failure with pulmonary stenosis. The heart will hypertrophy, but not fail. So when you look at a chest X-ray, the heart size will be normal. And this is a classic. Now notice here, Mogul number one is the aorta down the left side. Mogul number two is the pulmonary artery. And look how this big pulmonary artery is very different from the one I showed you with ASD. First of all, the heart size is normal, but the pulmonary artery is not confined to the left heart border. It's sticking its nose out into the lung fields. Why? Because this is valvar pulmonary stenosis causing a jet on the main and left pulmonary artery that makes it dilate. And so anytime you see that sticking its nose out into the lung fields, this has been called the witch's nose, and this is valvar pulmonary stenosis. This one had a gradient of 100. What do we do about it? Well, we can offer surgery. We've been doing that for many years, but nowadays, if the valve's pliable, we can do a balloon valvotomy. And this is what the guidelines say. If you've got moderate or severe PS and symptoms of cyanosis or you're shunting through a PFO or exercise intolerance, you can do a balloon valvuloplasty in experienced centers. And if you've got patients who have either failed a valvuloplasty or they're not eligible for it because the valve is lumpy, you can consider a surgical valvotomy, both of which are extremely low risk. And even if you're asymptomatic, if it's severe, intervention is considered reasonable with a class 2A indication. But beware, this is another lesion that is not necessarily considered corrected, because once that valve is split open, either with a balloon or with surgery, you may have pulmonary regurgitation. In fact, pulmonary regurgitation is likely. So if you have a patient, some years after valvotomy, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, if you've got a big right ventricle, maybe they have arrhythmias, maybe they have secondary TR, always look for pulmonary regurgitation because that's a sequelae. Co-optation of the aorta. Now we're moving to the arterial system. This is a lesion that usually occurs distal to the left subclavian, distal to the left subclavian, so you get high blood pressure in the upper limbs and low pressure in the legs, sometimes with claudication. And you get collaterals, which can come from the subclavian, the internal mammary, intercostals, which can try and bypass the coarctation. Remember, this lesion is commonly associated with a bicuspid aortic valve and also with Turner's syndrome. The web neck, the wide spaced eyes, low set ears, and typical facial features. Always look for coarctation. What about physical exam? You're all familiar with the delayed femoral pulses. You may have a systolic murmur, which may even be continuous and you may hear collateral murmurs at the back. You may feel them. You may have the fourth sound with the hypertension and the left ventricular hypertrophy and the loud A2. And because of the bicuspid valve, you may have an ejection click and concomitant features depending on whether the valve functions normally or not. 
The chest X-ray may be characteristic, but it's easy to miss, and you may see rib notching from the intercostal collaterals, but typically we can diagnose this with a good physical exam, an echo Doppler, and other imaging such as CT or MRA, rarely an angiogram. Now here's a chest X-ray. Look at this. If you look at the left side of the heart, you see what's been called a figure three sign. This is dilatation of the aorta above the coarctation and post-notic dilatation below. You may see rib notching from the intercostal arteries eroding the inferior rib marges, uh, margins. So look for that figure three sign. It's not very common to find, however, and this person who has a gradient of 100 has terrible rib notching but no evidence of that figure three sign. So keep your eyes skinned and always remember in any patient to feel the femoral pulses. It's really important. I just saw a 68-year-old man who's had hypertension since he was 16 and a severe coarctation has been missed. Bicuspid valve in up to 75% of coarcts. And remember, in this situation, there is an aortopathy with or without the bicuspid valve. This is like a, a Marfan aorta. You've got fragmentation of these elastic fibers in the media, and this aorta is pathologically fragile. Here's someone with a dissection, a young person with a bicuspid valve and coarctation. We have to replace these aortic roots at 5.5 centimeters with a bicuspid valve, and if you have both a bicuspid valve and a coarctation, your aorta is more likely to have both aneurysm and or dissection. So the message, image the entire aorta when you have this lesion. Here's a moderately severe coarctation. Here's another one that doesn't look so bad, but look at this aortopathy. This ascending aorta is four and a half centimeters. Look at the head vessel. This whole aorta is essentially rotten in this situation, and they need lifelong imaging. When do we intervene? Hypertension and significant coarctation. What do we mean by significant coarctation, though? If there's a difference of 20 millimeters between the upper extremity and the lower extremity, you've got a peak-to-peak -peak gradient of 20 millimeters or more. That is significant. But be careful, you can be faked out because of the collaterals. So you can have significant collaterals bypassing the coarct, and the femorals may not feel so bad. You can have a gradient of perhaps only 10, and the collaterals can fake you out, particularly, for example, if your LV function is decreased or you've got aortic regurgitation. So you have to image anatomically. But 20 millimeters otherwise is significant. Image the site with CT or MR. Here you see a very severe one that had been overlooked. You can miss this on Doppler if you don't get that Doppler immediately where the coarctation is. And so beware collateral flow, which can make your exam inaccurate, and it can make your echo Doppler inaccurate. Again, do CT or MR. We can treat them now with um, surgery or balloon and stent. We can do that successfully. We've been repairing co since the 1940s. You can chop it out and put the two ends together, do an end-to-end -to -end anastomosis. You can place a graft. You can put a Dacron patch to open it up, or you can turn down the subclavian and make a flap to open up that narrowing. But, again, not totally corrected. 75% of patients at 30 years follow-up will have hypertension, and people die because of coronary disease, heart failure, stroke, and this aortopathy with dissection and rupture. It's true the earlier age at repair, the better the survival, but survival isn't normal. Look at this study, mean age at death, 38 years. 30 year survival, 72%. Here's a more recent study by age at repair, cutoff is 20 years. It's not normal survival. 
So yes, it's better if you have an early repair, but survival is still not normal. And why do they die? Coronary disease, sudden death, heart failure, stroke, this aortopathy. They need lifelong follow-up. They may get recoarctation. Again, the echo may underestimate it. And patients who have a patch repair with Dacron, which disrupts the aorta, are very vulnerable to getting particularly an aneurysm formation at the site of repair. It's most common after a patch repair. You may not see it on chest x-ray like this. You need to image with CT or MR, lifelong follow-up with imaging. Look at this after a patch repair. It's humongous. And this person demonstrating the aortopathy who has a good repair of coarctation but dissected the ascending aorta eight years after surgery. So again, image the entire aorta, lessons, follow up, meticulous blood pressure control at rest and exercise, image the entire aorta, screen for coronary disease, and last, image the head, because there is an increased incidence of cranial aneurysms with coarctation, one of the reasons that people stroke. So, take home points. Age at repair predicts survival, but it's never normal. Lifelong follow-up, blood pressure control, image the aorta, and risk factor modification. Lastly, Epstein's anomaly, this problem with the tricuspid valve where it's displaced inferiorly. This is a variable spectrum. Our oldest patient is in their 90s with no surgery, but about half the patients will have either an ASD or PFO, and they may be blue, shunting right to left, and arrhythmias are common, 25% have an accessory pathway. What do we find on their exam? They often um, have a cool periphery, and they may be peripherally cyanosed because of a low cardiac output. Because of tricuspid regurgitation, you may see a V-wave, but you may not because the right atrium is so big it absorbs the regurgitant tricuspid volume. You may have a subtle right ventricular lift. You may hear a loud tricuspid noise because there may be a big leaflet flapping around when it closes. You may hear the murmur of tricuspid regurgitation and you may hear multiple clicks from that tricuspid valve. Here's a typical X-ray. Notice this big globular heart. But let's look again at the center. You should see an ascending aorta here. You should see a descending aorta on the left side, followed by a pulmonary artery. Well, here, what we don't see is an ascending aorta, a descending aorta, or a pulmonary artery. This vascular pedicle is very narrow, and that tells you there is a low cardiac output. So this huge heart with severe TR, no visible aorta or pulmonary artery, and clear lung fields is a classic for Epstein's. You may see right bundle branch block on the ECG. You may see the pre-excitation, and you get big P waves. I'll show you an example. And of course, they may have fibrillation or flutter. Look at these P waves. Helen Taussig called them Himalayan P waves. You get either partial or complete right bundle branch block, very fractionated QRS with T wave inversion. This is a classic for Epstein's. You repair this tricuspid valve or replace it early. Don't let patients get symptomatic. If exercise capacity is going down or they're cyanotic, they're at risk of stroke through that PFO ASD, we can repair these valves in experienced hands and don't wait till the right ventricle is bigger than a bread box and you have severe dysfunction. These patients can live long lives if this valve is repaired or replaced early. Lastly, genetic syndromes. Just to sum up, Holt-Oram syndrome, heart hand with secundum ASD. Down syndrome, AV septal defects, partial or complete AV canal. Noonan syndrome with pulmonary stenosis and Turner syndrome with coarctation. If the RV is big, find the shunt. This is not pulmonary stenosis. Secundum ASD, if the RV is big, you just close it. You don't need to do a cath. 
other ASDs, you need surgical closure. A VSD makes the LV big. If the LV is big, you close it. If the LV is normal, leave it alone. Severe pulmonary stenosis, you can balloon. The ejection click is the only right-sided sound which decreases on inspiration. And lastly, co-octation, intervene with 20 millimeters gradient between the arms and the legs with the caveats. And remember, lifelong follow-up imaging the entire aorta. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, nicely done. Come and have a seat. Now, remember, that was simple lesions. <laughs> You're going to be in for a treat when you hit the complex <laughs> lesions. Okay, let's go back to the questions, and we'll quickly go through the questions because you've had them before. This is a Downs kid who has shortness of breath and tired. The examination has an RV lift, displaced apex, a 2 over 6 systolic ejection murmur at the pulmonary area with a widely split second heart sound. There's a 3 over 6 holosystolic murmur, and the electrocardiogram is shown here. Okay, so Carol showed you this electrocardiogram, but there are some abnormalities here which clue you in for the diagnosis. So what is the diagnosis? A secundum ASD, a muscular VSD, pulmonary stenosis, Epstein's anomaly, or primum ASD? Go ahead and click in your answer. And I think you'll have quite a lift here. Perfect. This is what they had said before. So they picked it up. Yeah. Any comment on the electrocardiogram that you might want to say? Well, the whole scenario to... tells you first it's Downs is one of the clues. And this person also has mitral regurgitation, so the holosystolic murmur. So everything, including the ECG, is leading you towards a primum atrial septal defect. So lots of clues there to make sure you can get this diagnosis. And the ECG is left axis, which you seldom see in any other kind of atrial septal defect. Okay. And we would go ahead and close them with a the device, right? Absolutely not. Because? Because the mitral valve is cleft and that needs um, repair, has to be repaired. And this defect is in the lower part of the septum so you can't get a device in there and get adequate rims around it to be able to secure a device. So this is surgical closure. All right. Question two. So she just talked about coarct. Does it occur proximal left subclavian? Will they have a normal blood pressure after end-to-end -end repair? Aortic aneurysms do not occur if the repair is performed in the first year of life. Um, Dacron patch repair is more commonly associated with aneurysm formation, and repair before age 14 is associated with normal survival. There was a kind of a 50-50 split here before. We'll see if they can get this because it's important when you follow up a patient to understand what Carol said about some of these complications that can occur. Okay, good. So you had this type of lift here, because a lot of people thought the Dacron patch repair is commonly associated with aneurysm formation. Good. I mean, I think this highlights, this seems like such a simple lesion, even if you don't have a bicuspid aortic valve. And it seems like you just chop the thing out and put the two ends together, and that should be the end of the story. But as I mentioned, the entire aorta is abnormal, so you're vulnerable to aneurysm dissection and so on. And remarkably, even when the aortic repair is perfect, you've got a wide open aorta, these patients have hypertension very commonly, which is one of the reasons, of course, that they get stroke and the aorta goes bad and they get premature coronary disease. So it's, it's an example where nothing is quotes corrected by surgery or stenting. And many patients will go away thinking, I never need to see another cardiologist. And uh, in fact, that's not the case. And as I shared, even if they're repaired early, early death, unfortunately, is, is common. And so um, 
we need meticulous follow-up, imaging, perfect blood pressure control. And importantly, they may have normal blood pressure at rest, but you put them on a treadmill and they may hit 230 millimeters of mercury on the treadmill. They need blood pressure control at rest and on exercise and follow up periodically in the special center. So you treadmill all of them yes. for the blood pressure. Yes. You scan their head. Yes. And then how often do you scan their aorta? If the aorta, for example, is normal, you might not do a complete imaging with MR or CT for you know two years or maybe three years. But if there's any dilatation anywhere or perhaps recoarctation or even postenotic dilatation, then the frequency of imaging becomes more frequent and then you might want to image them either every year or every two years, depending on whether there's a change. Okay, a lot of imaging. A lot of imaging, yeah. All right, 24-year-old man, heart murmur, parasternal thrill, loud holosystolic murmur in clear lung fields. He's got an ejection fraction of 60% with an echo dropout in the VSD adjacent to the tricuspid valve through which the Doppler jet has a velocity of five meter per second. His TR velocity is 2.3 meter per second. So you're putting this all into your head and figuring out what's going on. Are you gonna cath him? Are you gonna repair his tricuspid valve? Are you gonna reassure him? Are you gonna close his VSD? Or are you going to send them to Kushwaha for pulmonary hypertension? Okay, so some people, though, would close his VSD. Why won't we close his VSD? It's a pretty loud murmur, isn't it? Yeah, so remember, um, the smallest holes make the loudest noise. So this is turbulence. Um, like kind of sticking your fingers in a hose pipe, makes a loud noise. So here there's a thrill, which is associated with a small VSD. Again, the murmur is loud. It has to be at least four over six if there's a thrill. And the left ventricular size is normal. Confirming that was the echo that had a five meter per second jet through that VSD. So that suggests that there's about a hundred millimeter of mercury difference between the LV and the RV. So this person requires no intervention. They can be left alone. It's not unreasonable to see them back in about five years just to make sure that there aren't any changes, that the LV isn't getting bigger, for example, but chances are this person will never require an intervention. Never. Maybe never. But just to be sure, see them every five years. Okay, and when you see them, um, your eval consists of? Clinical exam, chest x-ray, and an echocardiogram. Okay. And if there's any doubt about exercise capacity, we have a very low threshold for all our congenital patients with exercise because remember, congenital patients have never known what normal is. And they may tell you, I'm fine, but they ne really never move themselves very much. So we use exercise testing a lot to really see what's their functional aerobic capacity. It's a great baseline to follow, and we use that for a lot of our patients. Okay, and since we don't know much about VSDs as general cardiologists, is there a difference between a muscular VSD, a subpulmonic VSD, a subaortic VSD? <laughs> a membranous VSD, should we treat those any differently or just follow what you said, just follow the LV? So first of all, I think, I mean, for all these patients, they deserve an evaluation in the center. So, um, you know, get in touch with your local adult congenital heart disease center so they can work with you to follow these patients. So the size of the defect determines prognosis, but also the location um, and Muscular defects often close spontaneously, so do perimembranous defects, they often close spontaneously. But the ones you have to watch out for are the ones that sit beneath the aortic valve or beneath the pulmonary valve, we call those supracrystal defects, because they have a tendency to have the cusps of the aortic valve prolapse into the defect because it's unsupported. And for some of those patients, we may close the defect to prevent progressive aortic regurgitation. 
So again, these people should be seen in centers and evaluated periodically. So not all VSDs are alike. Exactly. Okay, 35-year-old woman, year of palpitations, presents with atrial fib. She's got an RV lift. She's got a murmur at the left sternal border and a rumble at the lower left sternal border. We're going to show you her chest x-ray. But her echo, she's got a normal LV. Her RV's big. Her atrial septum and ventricular septum are intact. And her RV systolic pressure is 40. Can't see her pulmonary valve. Here's the chest x-ray. What's the diagnosis? Sinus venosus, ASD, pulmonary stenosis, VSD, tricuspid stenosis, Epstein's anomaly. There was a wide scatter before. We'll see if that scatter proves. Mm -hmm. A little bit, not enough. Why isn't this pulmonary stenosis? There's a murmur there, right? Oh dear. Um Again, the heart size here is big. The heart does not get big with <laughs> you can, I don't know. Can you hear? I, the, the audience can't hear these guys laughing, but when you say, oh, dear, and they were fellows, that's a bad sign. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go, go ahead. <laughs> so, yes, oh, dear, bad fellows. Um, so the heart does not get big with pulmonary stenosis. This right ventricle will hypertrophy, but it doesn't dilate. And here you can clearly see a big right ventricle. And look at the increased pulmonary vascularity in the lung fields. So that's not associated with pulmonary stenosis. And as you look at mogul number two coming down the left side, yes, the pulmonary artery is big, but it is confined to the heart border. So you do not have a witch's nose with this post-stenotic dilatation. This is a big pulmonary artery, and it's big because you have increased flow through the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery is way bigger than the aorta. So this is classic for a left to right shunt. And you've already said on the echo that the RV is big, so you have to find the shunt. And if you can't find it on echo, either do a TEE or some other imaging. So if the area around the fossa ovalis appears intact, you've got to go on the hunt for a shunt. Is it a sinus venosus? Is it anomalous veins? You have to find the shunt. And the RV being big? And the RV is big because there's left to right shunting. So why isn't it pulmonary stenosis that the RV is big? Because the right ventricle hypertrophies, but it does not dilate in pulmonary stenosis. Oh, another oh, OD. Oh, dear. Okay, so the right ventricle does not dilate in pulmonary stenosis. Okay, so they should be a normal heart size then. RV's big, find the shunt. Okay, next one. 40-year-old woman, history of heart murmur, has progressive dyspnea. She's got an A wave on her venous pressure. You didn't say how high her venous pressure is, though. RV lift and ejection click with a 3 over 6 systolic ejection murmur, which increases with inspiration. There's a normal LV, normal size RV, and a TR velocity of 4.5 meter per second. What are we going to do? TEE, CT scan, cardiac cath to assess her degree of shunt, cardiac cath to put a balloon across the pulmonary valve, or cardiac cath to give her nitric oxide and then send her to Kushwaha. Getting a lot of referrals. Okay. Are you going to comment? So, m most people got it. You might think about doing a transesophageal echo in this circumstance, but honestly, finding a pulmonary valve on transesophageal echo is not always easy and you can't always image it very well. The pulmonary valve often can be overlooked on a transthoracic study. Um, a clue for everybody, if you're not used to doing it, is tip the patient vertically to the bed and then try and get at the pulmonary valve that way. But everything here, based on this echo and your clinical exam, is telling you that this person has severe pulmonary stenosis. You've got this ejection systolic murmur 
that's getting louder on inspiration. You've got to click. Everything is telling you it's pulmonary stenosis. And really, you could just go ahead and with, go ahead with the planned pulmonary valvotomy. TEE is unlikely to be particularly helpful in this regard. But, but how do you know it's not just pulmonary hypertension if your TR velocity is 4.5? Because if you had pulmonary hypertension here, the TR velocity was very high, but you've got a loud murmur. Oh, so you examine the patient. You have to examine the patient, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is not at all consistent with pulmonary hypertension. And if you had pulmonary hypertension, you'd have a loud P2. And in pulmonary stenosis, you've got this loud murmur with a click. And the second sound, P2, gets quieter the more severe the stenosis. So you have so to teach the fellows how to examine the patient. Absolutely. You have all to right. teach everybody how to examine the okay. patient.